Last time we took a look at an explicit control evaluator for Lisp, and that bridged the gap between all of these high-level languages like uh, Lisp and the query language and all of that stuff, bridged the gap between that and a conventional register machine. And in fact, you can think of the explicit control evaluator either as, say, the uh, code for a Lisp interpreter if you wanted to implement it in the the assembly language of some conventional register transfer machine, or if you like, you can think of it as the microcode of some machine that's going to be specially designed to run Lisp. In either case, what we're doing is we're taking a machine that speaks some low-level language, and we're raising the machine to a high-level language like Lisp by writing an interpreter. So for instance, uh, here, conceptually, But here, conceptually, is a, a special purpose machine for computing factorials. It right? takes in 5 and puts out 120. And what this special purpose machine is, is actually a Lisp interpreter that's configured itself to run factorials because you fed into it a description of the factorial machine. Right? So that's what an interpreter is. It configures itself to... Uh, emulate a machine whose description you run, you read in. Now inside the Lisp interpreter, what's that? Well, that might be a general register language interpreter that configures itself to behave like a Lisp interpreter because you put in a whole bunch of instructions in register language. This is the explicit control evaluator. And then it also has some sort of library, library of primitive operators and Lisp operations and all sorts of things like that. That's the general strategy of interpretation. And the point is, what we're doing is we're writing an interpreter to raise the machine to the level of the programs that we want to write. Well, there's another strategy, a different one, which is compilation. Compilation's a little bit different. Here, here we might have produced a special purpose machine for, for computing factorials. starting with some sort of machine that speaks register language, except we're going to do a different strategy. We'll take our factorial program. We'll use that as the source code into a compiler. What the compiler will do is translate that factorial program into some register machine language. And this will now be not the explicit control evaluator for Lisp. This will be some register language for computing factorials. Right, so this is the translation of that. That will go into some sort of loader which will combine this code with code selected from the library to do things like primitive multiplication. And then we'll produce a load module, which configures the register language machine to be a special purpose factorial machine. Right, so that's a, that's a different strategy. In interpretation, we're raising the machine to the level of our language, like Lisp. In compilation, we're taking our program and lowering it to the language that's spoken by the machine. Well, how do these two strategies compare? The compiler can produce code that will execute more efficiently. Uh, the essential reason for that is that if you, if you think about the register operations that are running, right, the interpreter has to produce register operations, which in principle are going to be general enough to execute any Lisp procedure. Whereas the compiler only has to worry about producing a special bunch of register operations for, for doing the particular list procedure that you've compiled. Or another way to say that is that the interpreter is a general purpose simulator that when you read in a list procedure then goes can simulate the program described by that, by that procedure. So the interpreter is worrying about making a general purpose simulator whereas the compiler in effect is configuring the thing to be the machine that the interpreter would have been simulating so the compiler can be faster. Okay. Okay. Okay, on the other hand, the interpreter is a nicer environment for debugging. And the reason for that is that we've got the, the source code actually there. We're interpreting it. That's what we're working with. 
And we also have the library around. See, the interpreter, the library sitting there is part of the interpreter. The compiler only pulls out from the library what it needs to run the program. So if you're in, if you're in the middle of debugging, and you might like to write a little extra program to examine some runtime data structure, or to produce some computation that you didn't think of when you wrote the program, the interpreter can do that perfectly well, whereas the compiler can't. So they're sort of dual, dual advantages. The compiler will produce code that executes faster. The interpreter's a better environment for debugging. And most uh, Lisp systems end up having both, end up being configured. So you have an interpreter that you use when you're developing your code. Then you can speed it up by compiling. And very often, you can arrange that compiled code and interpreted con code can call each other. And we'll, we'll see how to do that. That's not hard. OK. In fact, the way we'll, in the compiler we're going to make, the way we'll arrange for compiled code and interpreted code to, to call each other is that we'll have the compiler use exactly the same register conventions as the interpreter. All right, well, the, the idea of a, a, of a compiler is very much like the idea of an interpreter or, or evaluator. It's the same thing. So the evaluator walks over the code and uh, performs some register operations. Right, that's what we did yesterday. Well, the compiler essentially would like to walk over the code and produce the register operations that the evaluator would have done were it evaluating the thing. Right, and that gives us a model for how to implement a zeroth order compiler. Right, a very bad compiler, but a, essentially a compiler. A model for doing that is you just take the evaluator, you run it over the code, but instead of executing the actual operations, you just save them away. And that's your compiled code. So let me give you an example of that. Right, suppose we're going to compile, suppose we want to compile the expression uh, f of x. So let's assume that we've got f of x in the x register and something in the environment register. And now imagine starting up the evaluator. Uh, well, it looks at the expression, and it sees that it's an application. And uh, it branches to a place in the evaluator code we saw called ev application. And then it begins, it stores away the operands in unev, and then it's going to put the, the operator in x, and it's going to go recursively evaluate it. That's the process that we walk through. And if you start looking at the code, you start seeing some register operations. You see assign to unev the operands, assign to exp the operator, save the environment, generate that, and so on. That's well, if we look on, on the overhead here, we can, see, we can see those operations starting to be produced. Here's sort of the first real operation that the evaluator would have done. It pulls the operands out of the exp register and assigns it to unev. And then it assigns something to the expression register. And it saves continue. And it saves env. And all I'm doing here is writing down the register assignments that the evaluator would have done in executing that code. And I can zoom out a little bit. Altogether, there are about 19 operations there. And this, is the this will be the piece of code up until the point where the evaluator branches off to apply dispatch. And in fact, in this compiler, we're not going to worry about apply dispatch at all. We're going to have, every, we're going to have both interpreted code and compile code always evaluate procedures, always apply procedures by going to apply dispatch. And that will easily allow interpreted code and compiled code to call each other. OK. Well, in principle, that's all we need to do. Right, you just run the evaluator. See, the compiler is a lot like the evaluator. You run it, except it stashes away these operations instead of actually executing them. Well, that's not, that's not quite true. There's, there's only one, one little lie in that. What you have to worry about is if you have a, a predicate, right, if you have some kind of test you want to do, obviously, at the point when you're compiling it, you don't know which branch of, these, of a conditional like this you're going to do. Right, so you can't say which one the evaluator would have done. So all you do there is, is very simple. You compile both branches. So you compile a structure that looks like this. That'll compile into something that says 
the code, the code for P, and it puts its result in, say, the val register. So you walk the interpreter over the predicate and make sure that the result would go into the val register. And then you compile an instruction that says branch if if val is true uh, to a place we'll call label one. Then we will put the code for B. So walk the interpreter walk the interpreter over B and then go to put in an instruction that says go to the next thing, whatever Whatever was supposed to happen after this thing was done, you put in that instruction. And here you put label 1. And here you put the code for A. And you put go to next thing. So that's how you treat a conditional. You generate a little block like that. And uh, other than that, this zeroth order compiler is the same as the evaluator. It's just stashing away the instructions instead of executing them. That seems pretty simple, but we've gained something by that. See, already that's going to be more efficient than the evaluator. Because if you watch the evaluator run, it's not only generating the register operations we wrote down, it's also doing things to decide which ones to generate. So the very first thing it does say here, for instance, is go do some tests and decide that this is an application. And then branch off to the place that, that handles applications. In other words, what the evaluator is doing is simultaneously analyzing the code to see what to do and running these operations. And when you, if you run the, eval the evaluator a million times, that analysis phase happens a million times. Whereas in the compiler, it's happened once, and then you just have the register operations themselves. OK, that's a, a zeroth order compiler. But it is a wretched, wretched compiler. It's really dumb. All right, let's, let's go back and, and look at this overhead. See, so look, at, look at some of the, the operations this thing is doing. We're supposedly looking at the operations and interpreting f of x. Now look here what it's doing. For example, here, it assigns to x the operator in fetch of x. But see, there's no reason to do that, because this is the compiler knows that the, opera the operator of fetch of x is, e is f right here. So there's no reason why this instruction should say that. It should say, well, assign to exp f. Or in fact, you don't need exp at all. There's no reason it should have exp at all. What, what did exp get used for? Well, if we come down here, we're going to assign to val look up the stuff in exp in the environment. So what we really should do is get rid of the exp register altogether and just change this instruction to say assign to val look up the variable value of the symbol f in the environment. Similarly, back up here, we don't need unev at all, because we know what the operands of fetch of x bar for this piece of code. It's the, li it's the list x. So in some sense, you don't want unev and x at all. See, what they really are, in some sense, those aren't registers of the actual machine that's supposed to run. Those are registers that have to do with arranging the thing that can simulate that machine. So they're always going to hold expressions which, from the compiler's point of view, are just constants, so can be put right into the code. So you can forget about all the operations worrying about x and unev and just use those constants. Similarly, again, if we go, go back and look here, there are things like assign to continue eval args. Now, that has nothing to do with anything. That was just the evaluator keeping track of where it should go next, right, to evaluate the arguments in some, 
in some application. But of course, that's irrelevant to the compiler because you, the, the, the analysis phase will have already done that. Right, so this is completely irrelevant. So a lot of these, these assignments to continue have not to, to do where the, the running machine is supposed to continue in keeping track of its state. It has to do with where the evaluator analysis should continue, and those are completely irrelevant, so we can get rid of them. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, well, if we, if we simply do that, make those kinds of optimizations, get rid of, right, get rid of worrying about exp and unev, and get rid of uh, these irrelevant register assignments to continue, then we can take this literal code, right, these sort of 19 instructions that the, that the evaluator would have done, and then replace them. Let's look at the, at the slide. Right, replace them by, we get rid of about half of them. Right, and again, this is just sort of filtering what the evaluator would have done by getting rid of the irrelevant stuff. And you see, for instance, here we, where the evaluator said assign val lookup variable value fetch of x, here we have put in the constant f. Here we've put in the constant x. Okay. So there's a, there's a little better compiler. It's, uh, it's still pretty dumb. It's still doing a lot of dumb things. And again, if we go look at the slide again, look at the very beginning here. We see a save the environment, assign something to the val register, and restore the environment. Where'd that come from? That came from the evaluator back here saying, oh, I'm uh, in the middle of evaluating an application. So I'm going to recursively call eval dispatch. So I'd better save the thing I'm going to need later, which is the environment. This was the result of recursively calling eval dispatch. It was evaluating the symbol f in that case. Then it came back from eval dispatch, restored the environment. But in fact, the actual thing it ended up doing in the evaluation is not, not going to hurt the environment at all. So there's no reason to be saving the environment and restoring the environment here. All right, similarly, uh, here I'm saving the argument list. That's a piece of the argument evaluation loop, saving the argument list. And here you restore it. But the actual thing that you ended up doing didn't trash the argument list. So there was no reason to save it. All right, so another way, to, right, another, another way to say that is that the... Uh, the evaluator has to be maximally pessimistic. Because as far from its point of view, it's just going off to evaluate something. So it better save what it's going to need later. But once you've done the analysis, the compiler is in a position to say, well, what actually did I need to save? And doesn't need to do any, doesn't need to be as, as uh, careful as the, as the evaluator, because it knows what it actually needs. Well, in any case, if we do that, and l eliminate all those uh, redundant saves and restores, then we can get it down to this. And you see there are actually only three, re only three instructions that we actually need down from the initial 11 or so, or the initial, tw the initial 20 or so in the original one. OK, and that's just saying, of those register operations, which ones did we actually need? Okay. All right. let, me, let me just sort of summarize that in another way, just to show you in a little better picture. Here's a picture of starting. This is looking at all the saves and restores. Right, so here's the expression f of x. And then this traces through, on the bottom here, the various places in the evaluator that were passed when the evaluation happened. And then here, here you see arrows. Arrow down means register saved. So the first thing that happened is the environment got saved. And over here, the environment got restored. And these, and so they're all the pairs of stack operations. Now, if you go ahead and say, well, let's, let's remember that we don't, that unev, for instance, is a completely useless register. 
And if we use the constant structure of the code, well, we, don't need, we don't need to save on if. We don't need unif at all. And then depending on how we set up the discipline of, the, of, calling, of calling other things that apply, we may or may not need to save continue. So that's the first step I did. And then we can look and see what's actually, what's actually needed. See, we, we don't didn't really need to save and or cross evaluating f because it wouldn't, it wouldn't trash it. So if we take advantage of that, then see, the evaluation of f here doesn't really need to worry about, about hurting end. And similarly, the evaluation of x here the, when the evaluator did that, it said, oh, I'd better preserve the function register around that, because I might need it later, and I'd better preserve the argument list. Right, whereas the compiler is now in a position to know, well, we didn't really need to save, do those saves and restores. So in fact, all of the stack operations done by the evaluator turned out to be unnecessary or overly pessimistic, and the compiler's in a position to know that. Okay. Okay. That's the basic idea. Right? We take the evaluator, we eliminate the things that you don't need that in some sense have nothing to do with the compiler at all, just the evaluator. And then you see which stack operations are unnecessary. And that's the basic structure of the, the compiler that's, that's described in the book. Let me just show you how uh, that example's a little bit too simple to see how, how you actually save a lot. Let's look at a little bit more complicated expression that f of g of x and 1. And I'm not going to go through all the code. There's a, there's a fair pile of it. I think there, there's something like 16 pairs of register saves and restores as the evaluator walks through that. Uh, here's a diagram of them. Right, so you see what's going on. You start out by, the evaluator says, oh, I'm about to do an application. I'll preserve the environment, I'll restore it here. Then I'm about to do the first operand. <coughs> here it recursively goes to the, to the evaluator. The evaluator says, oh, this is an application. I'll save the environment. Do the operator of that combination, restore it here. This, sa this restore matches that save, right, and so on. There's unev here, which turns out to be completely unnecessary. Continues getting bumped around here. The function register is getting, getting saved across the first operand, across the operands. Right, all sorts of things are going on. But if you say, well, what, what did those really were the business of the compiler as opposed to the evaluator, you get rid of a whole bunch. And then on top of that, if you say things like uh, the evaluation of f doesn't hurt the environment register, or simply looking up the symbol x, you don't have to protect the function register against that. All right, so you come down to just a couple, of, a couple of pairs here. And still you can do a little better. Look what's going on here with the environment register. The environment register comes along and says, oh, here's a combination. This evaluator, by the way, doesn't know anything about G. So here it says, so it says, ah, I better save the environment register because evaluating G might be some arbitrary piece of code that would trash it, and I'm going to need it later after this argument for doing the second argument. So that's why this one didn't go away because the compiler made no assumptions about what G would do. On the other hand, if you look at the, what the second argument is, that's just looking up one. That doesn't need this environment register. So there's no reason to save it. So in fact, you can get rid of that one too. And from this whole pile of, of register operations, if you simply do a little bit of reasoning like that, you get down to, I think, just two pairs of saves and restores. And those, in fact, could go away further if you, if you knew something about G. All right, so again, the general idea is that the reason the compiler can be better is that the interpreter doesn't know what it's about to encounter. It has to be maximally pessimistic in saving things to protect itself. 
the compiler only has to deal with what actually had to be saved. And there are two reasons that something might not have to be saved. One is that what you're protecting it against, in fact, didn't trash the register, like it was just a variable lookup. And the other one is that the thing that you were saving it for might turn out not to actually need it. So those are the two basic pieces of knowledge that the compiler can take advantage of in uh, making the code more efficient. Okay. Okay, let's break for questions. You kept saying that the uneval register or un unev register didn't need to be used at all. Does that mean that you could just have a six register machine, or is it in these particular examples it didn't need to be used? For the compiler, you could generate code for the six register five, right? Because there's exp goes away also. Assuming, yeah, you, you can get rid of both exp and unev. Because see, those are data structures of the evaluator. Those are all things that would be constants from the point of view of the compiler. The only thing is this particular compiler is set up so that interpreted code and compiled code can coexist. So the way to think about it is, is maybe you build a chip, which is the evaluator. And what the compiler might do is generate code for that chip. It just wouldn't use two of the registers. All right, let's take a break.